Delmarva Today with Don Rush. There's a housing boom in Sussex County, but what about affordable housing? Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. There have been about 30,000 building permits approved in Sussex County for the last couple of years. And as one drives down the two-lane highways, you can see entrances for one housing project after another. And some go for a half a million dollars apiece. The county is now turning its attention to affordable housing, especially for the workforce. In our studio this morning, we have Greg Bassett, editor and general manager for the Salisbury Independent Newspaper, and Susan Canfor, news reporter for Coastal Point and freelancer for the Salisbury Independent. Welcome to the program, guys. Hey, Don. Thank you. Good morning. So I want to turn to you first, Susan, and tell me then a little bit about this housing boom that's taking place. Um, I did actually take a drive not too long ago, and it was like every once in a while I would see these entrances to what would eventually be these very pricey homes. Yes, all over uh, Lower Sussex County, and more of them are coming. They're, you know, the developers are asking for approval from the Planning and Zoning Commission, which, of course, either makes a favorable or unfavorable recommendation to the Sussex County Council. And uh, a lot of them have, have had, you know, sometimes scores, maybe 100 people at these public hearings complaining and saying, no, we, we don't want any more development. You know, you can't get on Route 64 now. In the summertime, it takes like, you know, an hour to go two miles to get to the beach. This isn't what we moved to Bethany Beach for. You know, we came here for a slower way of life. And, you know, the slogan slower, lower Delaware, and, you know, now we have these housing booms, and, you know, these people are they're building houses on, excuse me, on, you know, what used to be fields and farmland where we grew up and we ran and played and, you know, chased each other, and it's all going away. You know, in the face in, uh, of, of Lower Delmarva, uh, Lower Sussex County is changing, and most of the locals are adamantly opposed to these developments, but they're coming, and they're, they're coming like crazy. And uh, some of the council members that I've talked to have told me on the record that uh, they can't say no to everybody because if you own property, you have a right to develop it. And, you know, the council could be sued by these developers if they refuse to let them develop. So as, you know, as long as they meet the requirements, they can develop. But the locals are very unhappy about it. And then, of course, one of the, one of the problems because of all this development is they're so darn expensive. They're like, you know six, five, six million dollar homes, and they're, they're beautiful homes. Uh, I talked to one developer, actually one designer, who, who lives in you know, Lower Sussex County a couple of weeks ago, and he told me he couldn't afford his own homes. He said, I designed them. He said, but I, I could never afford them. And he said, they're, you know, they're, they, and they have these add-ons. They say, oh, I'm going to downsize. We're going to leave Silver Spring or Washington, and, you know, we're going to come to Delaware, and we're going to downsize. But he said, once they get here, they see all these possible add-ons, like, you know, indoor swimming pools and uh, extended decks and patios, and they say, yeah, I want this, and I want this, and I want this. And then the house is just as expensive and just as big as, as the one they came from. And they have grandchildren. A lot of them have grandchildren and extended families who come and stay with them. So the problem is the average person, who's like a, a council member, Sussex County Council member John Riley, told me, teachers, nurses, Certainly newspaper reporters who don't make a lot of money, you know, who ha are living on a budget, of, you know, within a certain amount of money every month, every year, who just can't, they can't afford to live there. And one of the other problems is people like that, like nurses, for example, I think certain nurses uh, who work at BB in certain departments are required to live within like 20, a 20 minute drive of the hospital. And probably the emergency personnel, I would guess, would have to be close enough, you know, to be able to get there within a few minutes. And they just can't, they can't find an affordable house. And they certainly can't find affordable rentals. So that's, that's the basic problem, Don. So the council has turned its attention to this concept of affordable housing. Um, what's the history behind that? And how effective is it going to be in terms of the long term and the short term? Are we going to see something that's going to, say, provide some immediate relief? Or is this going to be a long term problem? Well, they are committed to doing something by the end of this year, and they're doing it in steps, and it's it's not going to be immediate. I don't think it'll be immediate at all. It's most things with government aren't. But uh, what their plan is, they have a three-pronged plan, and a part of that plan is to um, offer developers, let's say if a developer builds a 100-unit rental building, you know, an apartment building, they're offering the developer um, – Maybe, uh, maybe, if they, maybe if they set aside 30 of those units or 30% of those units, say there's 100 units and they set aside 30 of those units and they offer them for 
an affordable rent every month, maybe seven or eight hundred dollars a month. The, the council will give the developer a higher density. So instead of only being able to have you know a hundred units, they might be able to have one hundred and thirty units. So the developer makes more money. And uh, one of the councilmen told me, if we don't give them an incentive, they're not going to do it. We have to give them something, you know, because it's not going to be out of the goodness of their hearts. So that's that's one of the first steps is to offer that offer that extra density as an incentive. And they're working on that right now. But uh, Brandy Nauman, she's the director of housing for Sussex County, she told me that's a great idea, and she's certainly behind it, and she certainly supports the Sussex County Council. But there are other caveats that have to be met uh, in order to do that, everything from, you know, from buffering to, uh, you know, all of the environmental requirements whenever there's a development. So it won't be fast, to answer your question. It won't be fast. But they are working on it, and they are committed to doing something about it. As far as the history, um, my understanding is that it's always been a problem, and as development increases and these bigger houses and more expensive developments pop up all over Lower Sussex County, it's more of a problem because people who want to rent can't find rentals. Most people are buying, and it's easy to find a house. It's easy to find an expensive house. It's easy to buy a piece of property and have one built. But if you want to rent something affordable, it's almost impossible. So that's the problem. Um, the history is when they worked on the, I think, 2018, it might have been 19, comprehensive plan when they updated it. Uh, they were getting uh, comments during public hearings from people who live in that area saying, you know, the biggest problem we have is we can't, we can't find rentals. And you know, you've got to do something about them. If we do rent a place, we might not have a car. It might, you know, it might be a kid who's um, who's living there for the summer, who's working working in, in the Ocean View, say, or Bethany for the summer. So we'd like it to be near public transportation. And, you know, we'd like we'd like like it to be more convenient for us. So Councilman Riley said the council very carefully listened, and they listened to these these anecdotal uh, stories that they heard from uh, you know from from Sussex County residents, and they're they're very committed to doing what they can to make it better. So they're not just saying, well, it's just, you know, it's just development. There's nothing we can do. They're working on it. How effective, though, are incentives as opposed to, say, a requirement? I think that remains to be seen. I think that's, this, is, this is kind of a new idea. Uh, if, if they require it, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's some law somewhere that the developers could get around if they require it. I'm not sure. But I think that, you know, the way to work with them so that everybody's, you know, in compliance and everybody's willing to work together would, would be an incentive. And that you know that that's kind of the mood of the Sussex County Council. They they do try to work with people. That's that's kind of their, their general personality. All of them, they do try to work with the public. Greg, Susan, when I talk to um, people in both counties in Wicomico County and well in Maryland and Delaware, the the engineers, developers in Delaware uh, say that they've got great sewer, uh, but they've got terrible roads. Whereas Maryland has great roads but terrible sewer. Uh, sewer is a big issue in Wicomico County in terms of growth and right. development. But the road situation really is bad up there. And what's interesting to me always was that the county um, does not have any role in the transportation and the roads. It's all managed by the state. Almost and, entirely, right. Yeah, and these right. And, and these roads just can't accommodate the, the housing. But, exactly. But the county can approve the housing, but then the state doesn't have the same obligation uh, to provide the roads. Whereas here, uh, State Highway has very much input on every development because they know they're going to have to provide the, the highway. Right, and that's, that's one of the constant arguments I hear when I cover public hearings for, for developments. Uh, almost everybody who's, who's opposed to them says, you know, you have to fix the infrastructure first. We have to widen the roads. We have to make sure we have enough water. We have to make sure, you know, we have enough water towers. And the, the Millsboro and Subbyville right now are both building new water towers. The Selbyville, little sleepy Selbyville, is growing like crazy. Every time I cover a Selbyville Town Council meeting, there's some new development coming up. And I think it's even a surprise sometimes to the Sussex County or the um, Selbyville Council members. But you're absolutely right. They, they really do have to do something with the roads first, and it's an ongoing problem. They do seem to have a little better working relationship with DelDOT, the Delaware Department of Transportation, than they used to. They, uh, they had a mutual aid signed about, about a year ago. And they are trying to do things uh, more compatibly between the state and the county, and they're also trying to do things more, more quickly. But I haven't, Greg and Don, I haven't seen any of the roads widened or, or improved. I've seen some, uh, you know, some intersections improved, 
and maybe some repaving and restriping. But, you know, until and unless they widen those roads, it's just going to get worse. The traffic is atrocious. I work in Ocean View, and there's a little diner probably maybe a mile and a half from where I work. And I went there for lunch one day, and I, I swear it took me almost an hour and a half to get back to the office. The traffic was not moving at all. That's in Ocean View on Atlantic Avenue. The traffic is just bumper to bumper on Atlantic Avenue. And then Route 54 on a Saturday morning, you can't move. It's, it's like, you, know, you Greg, you and I spent a lot of time in Ocean City in our lifetimes. It's much like the backup going over the 50 Bridge on a Saturday yeah. in the summer. It just doesn't move. Because when, you know, yeah, when, when they, when they uh, was talking to someone the other day, and they said that one of the problems with Del Dot is that they have X amount of dollars and that they put those towards what they consider to be priority. And Sussex County seems to be um, last on the list, especially for the kinds of um, developments and the kind of land areas that they have. That's been a constant complaint. A lot of hurt feelings in lower Sussex County about that. And I've heard that over and over again. And I think that's why they signed this mutual aid agreement to, to try to, you know, be on better terms with Del Dot and to try to get things done, but, you know, a little bit faster. But they, they have, they've said that about lower Sussex for a long time. Lower Sussex is always the last one that Del looks at. I understand that there's supposed to be some money coming from the American Rescue Plan Act to, to the trust. Tell me a little bit about uh, the function of that trust and where that money might go. To, to the trust, the trust is to help with affordable housing, to help help the county, help to help the county help the developers build more affordable housing. And I think it was six. I don't have the story right in front of me here. I have my laptop open, but I don't have the article right in front of me that I wrote. I think it's like six million dollars they got the county got mm -hmm. from from the uh, uh, from the upper funds, and that money will go uh, to the to the trust fund to help with the affordable housing problem. And the woman who's in charge of the Sussex County Housing Department told me it was an unexpected and incredible boost, and it, and it will help. It'll help tremendously. But all these other things, you know, are delay it. Like I like I said, all you know the caveats that she talked about. It, it all has to be put in place before they can start to build. And then the developers have to take an interest in it, too. They have to say, yeah, we want to do this. You know, the, the money for the developers and the, and the, the contractors, the money is in those big houses. Mm. So uh, there might have to be some better incentive than, than just the density. Although that's a big incentive to developers, there might have to be something else. Because they, they really like to build the great big houses and the big developments. Sure. I mean, half a million dollars, say 300 oh, homes, and... You know, you can do the math. I think, I think I saw, I think, I think I saw where I think it's Sussex County kind of supposed to get something like nine point nine million. I think, I think it was a figure. I think I saw. Um, Just for housing? Yeah, for for the okay. housing. Yeah, I think it's for the for the housing as I re, as I remember it. But don't hold us okay. to it. <laughs> oh, okay. I was thinking six, but I, I yeah. could I could be I could be wrong. But it's a lot of money. It's, it's a lot of money. More than yeah, they would, they would ever have. You know, they, more than they could ever have expected. Yeah. So uh, in terms of, um, we have one other thing, which is, of course, it's a small houses. They call pallet houses, the pallet homes. They're tiny structures, about 600 yeah. square feet, I guess, if you're deciding to downsize anytime soon. But they, of course, these are really directed towards the homeless. Well, what do we know about that so far? Because I know there's a, a project already in place that's uh, being developed in Georgetown. There is a company in Georgetown that's, uh, I think it's a company that, or I guess it's a nonprofit, it's not a company that's dedicated to uh, finding homes for the homeless, and they are building these tiny houses. And, and, but then again, they're not, they're, not in, they're not regulated by the county zoning yet. The county zoning it doesn't really have a, a, a strong zoning code for them. So that's another thing county council is working on. Uh, one of the council members told me that somebody had a, a trailer, I think he said like a camper, in his backyard, and he wanted to call that a bed and breakfast, a tiny house bed and breakfast. And he wanted to use it, you know, to make money, to have people come and spend the night out in the woods. And it sounds like a great idea, but there was no water and sewer. Right. So, you know, so they, but they, they couldn't do it. They wouldn't allow it. It's a great idea if you can get away with it. But um, it didn't have any, any water and sewer. And what, what Councilman O'Reilly told me was that the way the code is written right now, and the way he said it was, you could drive a truck through it. That's how wide open the code is. You know, it's, it's not strict enough right now to really regulate tiny houses. But they seem to be you know, kind of the up-and-coming thing. There are two or, two or three of them behind, um, what's the name of it? It's like a, a it's, in, it's in Millville. It's between Ocean View and, and Bagsboro. And it's, it's, a little, um, it's a little natural, like a natural restaurant. I can't think of the name of it, but it's, it's right up the street from the paper where I work. And there are three little tiny houses back on, on their property. And they're very well kept there. You know, they're cute and they're, they're convenient. 
And I think that might be the way of the future for senior citizens or anybody who doesn't want, you know, who wants to travel and just have kind of a place to, to change their clothes and come home and, and go back out again. So I think we'll see more talk about that uh, as far as Sussex County Council. We'll see them talk more about that in the future. Uh, how serious, by the way, is homelessness there? Do you have a sense about that? Uh, my understanding is it's just like everywhere. There are pockets of it here and there, but, you know, lower Sussex County and, and the Ocean View area, the Bethany area, it's a, it's a, very comfortable financially it's a very comfortable area so you know you would see homelessness in the other in the out, you know in the outskirts of Sussex County but not in the in the towns where the development is not that I know of anyhow it might be you know sometimes homelessness is, is quiet too sometimes you know it's, it's such an embarrassment that you know you, you don't you don't really hear that much about it but if, if it's if it is a problem I have confidence that the Sussex County Council will definitely work on it they seem very committed to working on all these problems well, Greg, I want to turn to you and pick up on a discussion we had uh, last week about daft tanks. That's the waste that's uh, stored there and then used on uh, farms as a soil amendment. The county council, Wicomico County Council, is considering a ban, of course, on such tanks. As I understand it, uh, you looked into the issue for your edition of their paper. And, but I would first want to begin with some sound from an interview I did with Lynette Kinney, who lives close to the uh, one that is located near Hebron. Well, the tank has been um, an ongoing operation. Uh, August 16th, we had uh, quite a bit of smell, even here in the summer. We were told originally that it was only going to be used through uh, December 15th through the end of February. It's being used continuously. Uh, the smell will, at times, drive you in the house. Um, the property values of our homes, we are concerned about that. But ultimately, it's a, it's a traffic issue as well. These tanker trucks are running on uh, narrow country roads that were not, not designed to take commercial traffic. Uh, it's tearing up the roads, and uh, it's, it's hazardous when you have to get off on the side and because there's no side to get off on. It's just a, a grassy area. There, there are no shoulders. So, Greg, what did you find as you looked into this issue? Yeah, Ms. Kenny's uh, one of the people who's done a really good job keeping on top of this thing, and she appears frequently at the county council um, and articulates the concerns of the neighbors and, and keeps everyone updated. Um, but not a lot that's new. Um, the, the council is having sort of a significant meeting on September 6th, uh, and it'll be a night meeting at 6 p.m., so it'll be easy for people to attend. But they're going to talk about this more. It just You get the sense that they're moving towards some sort of a ban, uh, it's in the hands of the lawyers right now. They want to make sure that they do the right thing. Uh, it's one of those issues that the more they ask about it, the more questions they come back with uh, where they where there aren't answers. Um, most most recently at the county council meeting this week, um, Holly Porter, who's head of the uh, Delmarva Chicken uh, Council Industry Association, I'm sorry, Delmarva Chicken Association, Association uh, she appeared, and, and she had not been at the previous meeting, um, which sort of had a crowd of anti-tank people. Um, she articulated that she was upset with the way that it was being described as the, the contents, the slurry was being disguised, de, de, described as waste, uh, that farmers see it as a valuable fertilizer, as valuable as uh, either water or their fertilizers. Um and that, it, that the council had sort of the wrong attitude on this. So I think that they're going to be uh, dogging this issue as well. Um, so that will be a significant meeting on that first Tuesday in September. Is this an issue of location? I mean, we just heard from Lynette a moment ago in which she, you know, there are these homes that are nearby. They're not that very far away in which they are obviously affected by the smell or by the trucks, as it were. Um, but if you place them, these out maybe further away from, say, any kind of residential homes that have been built, it seems to me that that might be better uh, acceptable to, to, the, to the council. Although I understand the Chicken Association has a problem with the, the amount of territory or acreage right. that would require. Right, whether there would be a setback or you'd yeah. have a minimum amount of property that would be on. But, you know, as Susan was talking about with growth and development in Sussex, the same is true in Wicomica. So, you know, just a few, two decades ago, Porter Mill Road would have been considered in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and that's where this thing is located. Uh, but but now it's not. There are people around there who are affected. And certainly the infrastructure with the roads, um, as Ms. Kenny pointed out, is is as big an issue perhaps as the, as the odor. Um, one of the thoughts was to make these things uh, in, in an industrial zone. 
Um, so when you look at where industrial zones are, that's like the industrial park, you know, in Salisbury. Do you really want something like that to be in the industrial park in Salisbury? Probably not if it's going to be an open top um, uh, tank in which odor would, would come out or flies and pests could get into. So whether they would make it a closed system, if they would mandate that, these are all issues that those attorneys are looking at, trying to figure out that they, that they can make the right decision that will not make everyone happy, but keep them from being sued and allow the farmers to continue to get their fertilizer. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that we have this one, say, near Hebron. I mean, how many of these do they think they would have? I mean, in terms of something that's that large, I mean, because it sounds like the association is saying, well, we need a bunch of these, but I don't get the sense that that's the case. Yeah. Last time when I was here, I said it was a million gallon tank. Yeah. I, I was wrong. It's a three million gallon tank. Um, and the analogy I used was the, the water tank uh, right here at Salisbury University, the city water tank is a million gallons. It's like the biggest water tank I've ever seen. This thing is on the ground and it's three million gallons. It's, it's huge. Um, and it's it's problematic. So where are they going to go with this if they only ban the big ones? Um, you know, I'm told that, and the council's not even sure how many farms might have their own versions of slurry tanks. Uh, I understand there's not a lot of opposition to that, but do you set a gallon limit, a size limit, a setback limit, uh, acreage limit, um, a limit proximity to you know, neighboring homes, um, all that stuff, or do you regulate it and put it in an indust in industrial area? Um, you know, there aren't a lot of those except in the city. There are some out in the county, but they're all pretty much located close to the where the sewer system is in, in the towns. Um, so that's not really the answer either. Um, but they're going to they're going to grab with this thing. I, I do have to say after two, two and a half years of trying to ignore it and kind of kick it back to the state and make it a state issue, a state uh, Department of Environment issue. The county's having to engage this thing now. Um uh, it was a bit of an election issue, not as much as I would have thought, but the council is going to engage this. And like I said, this this first meeting will be significant. Now, it's about talking to Carol Donahue, uh, who's with the Wacomico Environmental Trust. She describes the current ones, the very small ones. These are actually mobile units that she says uh, that are actually used when they apply it. And so they, you know, once they're done applying it, then it's, it's done, as opposed to, say, for instance, that stationary one that we have, say, near Hebron. Um, she also said that initially her organization was not necessarily in favor of banning this. And this is, this is what she told me. We had not asked for a ban. That, that idea originated from the council itself. And the council's attorney, uh, what gave us pause was specifically the remarks of the, zone, the county zoning administrator at the council's meeting on July 5th where he told the council after uh, a lengthy discussion by, the, by council members of what kind of conditions they might like to impose, that he, he wouldn't be able to impose any conditions because they wouldn't be able to write legislation that was specific enough for him to know whether it applied uh, to, to a particular storage tank. <laughs> and, uh, and that since this material was agricultural in nature, in his view, the Right to Farm Act would require that its storage be permitted throughout the agricultural district. We disagree with that interpretation of the facts and the law, uh, but, but if that's the considered view of the zoning administrator, then a, a ban might be safer. At least uh, one could be confident that the council's intention would be would be implemented so what about that this uh, th it seems as if they were almost caught off guard because they were trying to get some restrictions uh, obviously the association has been pushing back on that and then out of the blue at least for carol anyway they got this suggestion that um a number of fact, uh, members of the council said well maybe we should be looking at a ban altogether yeah i, I, they, I think they just wanted to go away <laughs> because uh they've been they've been having to face the issue for so long and they don't have an easy solution so a ban might be an easy solution. Uh, you know, and Carol Donahue, who, who's actually an environmental lawyer, no one knows more about this stuff than, than Carol, but um, it, it is difficult to write a bill that, that satisfies everything. And also look at the origin of this thing. You know, the way it's been described to me, this is something that, you know, environmentally sensitive people thought was a good idea uh, in terms of getting rid of this stuff, um, you know, which is not necessarily waste. It, it has its fertilizer that has some value, you know, d despite how it smells. And and uh, how it's stored, so they're they're navigating that. Um, 
in terms of what regulations there are. But yeah, the zoning administrator, um, uh, it, it's a very di- yes, they have to enforce the law. The law has to make sense. It has to be bulletproof from any kind of a challenge, and, and that's the situation that they're in now. But you know, the the I think the intent of this thing was probably positive. The result and how it's been perhaps handled uh, at the Porter Mill Road site has been problematic. By the way, we'll turn to um, apparently um, another issue has been mail-in ballots. Um, we finally obviously know who won <laughs> after right. a few weeks. Um, but I understand the Maryland State uh, Board of Education has voted unanimously to uh, petition to have those uh, counted early. Yeah, the Board of Elections wants to go back to the way they did things before. The The governor actually vetoed a bill um, that Governor Hogan vetoed a bill um, that would have allowed mail-in ballots to be counted in advance. Um, as with early voting. So early voting takes place. They release the results, you know, as soon as the polls close on the actual election day. This would allow also mail-in ballots that are counted in advance to, uh, to be announced, you know, when the polls close on election day. That would certainly help people like Susan and I who are trying to cover elections um, yes. because it, it, we had to wait, you know, whatever it was, 10 days for, for the mail-in votes to trickle in and be counted uh, but but people people want to know that night they want they want to make sure that of course there's integrity in the system, and I think you add a question of integrity, which really is not a question, but it gets asked, and in seeing how many votes are needed, if a candidate needs votes and then magically those votes appear, um, if all those things are are decided in advance and we know when the polls close. Uh, I think that will help with voter confidence. Susan, what do you what are you seeing on your end of this? Because you obviously be, reach into, into into Maryland as well. Yes, I absolutely agree with Greg. And people want to know that night, and that, that's probably that was probably one of the biggest things we struggled with was trying to get the the uh, results in the paper. When I was with the Salisbury Independent full time, trying to get the results in the paper that night, and the, the sooner the better. Of course, that wasn't always possible, Greg, as you know. But uh, the sooner the better. And it, with integrity, absolutely. It, Delaware has a primary election coming up in September. Yes. Yeah, and their their elections are on Saturdays, um, which a re- lot of them are for the little towns. But yes, most yeah. of them are for the little towns. Mm-hmm. Which which really makes sense. So when I covered elections in Sussex, that they, they were really easy to cover, um, be, because especially because the primary was on a Saturday, and uh, it, it was much more convenient for people to vote. They, well, yes and no. I've, I've also gotten a lot of complaints from people who say that the hours are too short and they work on a Saturday or they are at a wedding or they're at a graduation right. and they can't make it. So some people have complained about it being on a Saturday, too, and they would like it to be extended, like the hours to be extended. But that's that, there you go. Again, that's where the mail-in ballot would be, be so much more convenient. But, but Susan, up in your, in your neck of the woods, um, is there this big question about uh, election integrity? Um, that we say, for instance, have seen down here uh, where people didn't know who was going to be, who was going to win, because some of the, obviously, the races were pretty close. I mean, what sense do you get about that? Because I know there's a fairly conservative uh, movement and groups, I think, in Delaware itself. Yeah, no, not, most of the elections I've covered have been the small town elections, which have been like Millsboro and Shelbyville. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't been with Coastal Point long enough to cover any of the big ones. That hasn't been part of my beat. Yeah, but with the small ones, there there hasn't really been a question of integrity as much as there's been a question of, you know, in Millsboro especially, the big the big controversy there has been, and, and was very recently within the past few weeks, that there, the um, elections weren't advertised. Because hmm. Millsboro just didn't advertise them enough, and they only had, I think, like 69 people come out to vote in the, in the previous election. So the, one of the new council members who actually who did win, uh, Kimberly Kahn, she unseated long-term council member Tim Hodges, who was mayor and pro tem mayor, and uh, it, actually at the time of his unseating, he was the uh, uh, the, the uh, mayor, the acting mayor, because the other mayor had had, uh, had resigned. But anyhow, she, she went on a really strong campaign and said, you know, nobody knows about these elections, and that's why the same people are winning year after year after year. And she went on a very strong strong campaign about more uh, openness, and not just with elections, but with the government in general. And in, if you, in Millsboro, I've been a newspaper reporter all my life, and I miss the elections sometimes in Millsboro. They just don't mention it at council meetings, and they don't advertise it. They might put up a little bulletin at the post office. Huh. But, but that's it. And there, there's been a lot of controversy about that. So uh, she went on the campaign, and it worked. Not so much with the, with the locals who have lived there for years and years, who know when the elections are, but the new people moving into these new developments. Like uh, Plantation Lakes is a huge, huge new development in Millsboro, and those people voted for her. 
and said, yes, we want more transparency, too, in government, and we want to know when the elections are. So that's been more of the, uh, the concern in what, what I cover right? when it comes to elections. But it's, it's been interesting, and she won. She kind of went on a one-woman campaign, and, and she won. She came here about two years ago, and she wanted to be part of the government, and she's now on, on the board. We've been speaking with Greg Bassett. He's the editor and general manager for the Salisbury Independent Newspaper. Also, Susan Canfora, a news reporter for the Coastal Point, as well as a freelancer for the Salisbury Independent. We appreciate you both of you uh, stopping by and chatting with us this morning. Thanks, Don. Yep, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Don. This has been Don Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. Del Marva Today with Don Rush.